Grace is enough. Hey, let's, let's pray real, real fast. Jesus, thank you for this morning. We ask that you bless this time of the word. God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart are not from me, but from you, God, to empower us, to build us up so that we can give thanks and praise to you, oh God. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm glad that you're here this morning. It's been uh, an amazing week. I mean, this week has uh, been uh, full of surprises. Uh, especially if you're from Chicago in that area. Oh my goodness, 108 years. What an amazing thing. There was enough grace for the Cubbies. So um, it was uh, one of those neat things of modern technology where, you know, I don't have cable, but um, I uh, found this guy who was Facebook living the game and me and 12,000 of my closest friends uh, were able to watch the World Series. And that was just kind of a neat moment. Um, but uh, it's been a full week, and um, I, I give a lot of thanksgiving because this is a week where uh, here at the church we got to host a lunch for a lot of other West Sac pastors, and so we were able to kind of be together and pray over each other in our ministries and our churches. Um, it was a week also that uh, I got to meet our police chief and uh, the, the um, assistant chief and a lot of other officers in our second meeting with uh, cops and clergy um, just to hear their hearts, to, to um, be able to know our officers our, our uh, men and women in blue, and so it was just a, a great mu uh, week of connecting, and I give thanks to God for that because um, we are connected in this community, and we need to uh, continue to be mindful of it, and um, I was really encouraged by one officer who felt that he uh, feels like a shepherd of this community, and I wonder if you and I feel like times. Shouldn't we feel like we shepherd what God has given us? Place we live and where we, we go to and from. And I think that's, that's an important thing to remain thankful for what God is doing. And so it's with that that as we um, go into the last part of this year um, that we're going to step into our new sermon series. And it's called It's a Wonderful Life. And uh, why don't you say to someone, it's a wonderful life. Just go ahead, say to, say to somebody, it's a wonderful life. And if you're by yourself, you can tell yourself that. That's okay. And uh, now I didn't say it was a perfect life. I didn't say it was an easy life. I didn't say um, it was um, just the exact life that you wanted. But with Jesus, we need to understand that uh, what we have the opportunity to live into is a wonderful life that we can give him thanks and praise for because he is a God of miracles and he is bigger than anything that we have ever encountered in this world. And as this month, as we go into the first part of this sermon series, we're going to give thanks. We're going to find different ways to give thanks to God. And one way that we decided to do that was we set up this, this little wall in the back of the church here, and it's a wall of thanksgiving and gratitude. And I encourage you at any moment, you can step up and walk over there and write down something that you're thankful for. It can be a word. It can be a paragraph like I wrote, um, whatever you would like. And it's just a demonstration that in this sanctuary, in this a sacred place where we offer God praise and worship, uh, it's a chance for us to come together and give that of, over to him. And my hope is by the end of the month when we encounter our, uh, our, our celebration of Thanksgiving, what we have and what we'll see is this beautiful mosaic of all the ways that this is giving thanks to God. And so I invite you to participate that. You can write one thing a week um, or you can wait to the end of the month, whatever you like. But that's, that's what that is over there. So for those of you who may be counting or may not be counting, there are exactly 48 days, 13 hours, and some change until Christmas morning. And I don't know if you knew that, um, but the great thing about that is that we're going to be together on Christmas morning, and it's a Sunday this year, and that we're going to celebrate the birth of our Lord, Emmanuel with us, God with us, excuse me, Emmanuel. And, uh, and so what that may mean for some of you is a lot of excitement. And what that may mean for the rest of us is that's how long your, um, your sentence is to live in bah humbug misery. And, um, and I was trying to think of an image that would capture both of these types of people. And I came up with this image from the web is, is you're either the person on the left or, or the person on the right. And, uh, and, and I'll be honest, I've been the person on the right before. And uh, I feel like so it begins. I feel like it begins in July these days. But uh, um, but I've also been the guy on the left. So, um, but it's exciting um, that we are living into this season. And uh, I want to just posture us as a church in the right way, way that we need to give God thanks. And uh, we need to be full of thanksgiving. And, uh, 
And in this series, we're going to discover that um, it's in giving and receiving. If we do both, we're going to get a lot more than if we just expect to receive things from people. I don't know if you've ever felt like this, where you have felt like you're kind of just an accessory to someone else in your life, that you're there to kind of be their little assistant with their plans or their schemes or their hopes and their dreams, and, and they just ask of you and ask of you and ask of you. Or if you, if you at times have been the person that just kind of takes and receives and receives and receives. I think sometimes we go in and out balance between the two, and, um, and I think it's really important that we build a life of understanding that life is both giving and receiving. And that if we are people of God, that we don't live in this gray tone world, that by the love of Jesus, we get to live in br brilliant, vibrant color because of his love. And that giving and receiving is part and parcel to maturity and discipleship. And that's my hope, is that we get to talk about uh, in these sets of conversations of what it means to live a wonderful life that we get to understand what we get to participate in. So there's been times where I have given and it's been really thought, heartfelt and, 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 uh, and there's been times where it's felt kind of artificial and mechanistic or, or kind of mechanical going through the motions. And, and I'm sure we all have been in seasons where giving has really been like, I'm going to put a lot of effort, I'm going to put a lot of time kind of just given whatever at certain times. I remember uh, the first Christmas, Jessica and I were married, and, um, you know, we're still getting to know each other as newlyweds, and um, we thought we'd be a modern couple, and we thought we'd make it easy on each other. And uh, what we did was we went completely digital for our gift giving, okay? And she went on Amazon and so did I, and we made this wish list, okay? And we had a set budget, and uh, the, the, the fun part was we would go and we would click, 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 and buy, 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 and it would be ship, ship, shipped, and we would take it and we'd wrap it, and, and uh, we thought it'd be easy, right? Well, it didn't go exactly as planned as Christmas morning came. And um, usually when you give a gift to someone, there's a lot of like, oh, thank you. It was like, oh, yeah, I ordered that. Oh, yeah, I ordered that. For both of us. It was just kind of like, wait a minute, something's wrong here. And I remember this one gift. She opened a, a blouse that she ordered, and she tried it on. And when she tried it on, one of the shoulders was about four inches higher than the other. So she kind of was like this. I'm like, how do I look? <laughs> That's a trap. I don't know how to get out of that one, you know? And uh, so there's nothing I could do with that one. And then the other thing that one of the items that she wanted was some makeup. Again, she made the list, not me, okay? But they sent the wrong color of makeup. Now, that is devastating, I know. I mean, I don't know, but I heard. And, uh, and I saw, and I found out. And so the whole process of this gift giving, it just didn't work. It was too artificial. I did try to make up for it, though, that on December 26th, the very next morning, I took that wrong color of makeup, got in my truck, and I went down to the Galleria Mall, and I braved Sephora, okay, makeup place, I hear, and there was like 500 other ladies inside, okay, and me, and I was trying to figure out where the right color was, and I was looking for like a, a ladies in a black smock or a white smock or someone with a name tag to help guide me, you know, and I couldn't find anyone, and it was just chaos, and uh, to me, it was chaos, and I found the right color, and, and I see this huge line, I get in the line, and, I, and I'm just a guy with one thing of makeup and with all these ladies and my creeper status is like at 9,000. Like I'm just really high, you know, and uh, I'm just trying to like just look up, just don't even just walk in the little snail line, you know, and it was just very uncomfortable. And, uh, <laughs> and I just remember like I had to put in the effort at that point to try to make up for the gift giving what should have been meaningful and I should have put in this time way before the holiday. So we're never going to do that again. And, um, but that, what it taught me was there's so much to be um, encountered, so much that's important about gift giving. That we live in a society right now where giving gifts is really, really easy sometimes. Or we're at a checkout and they say, do you want to add a dollar to give a gift to a child or a veteran or something? And we kind of just, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, whatever. You know, we don't put a lot of thought into it. 
But that's not what we're called to do as the people of God, as, as God's children. We need to understand that giving, we need to focus on the approach that we give. And, you know, it's, it's easy at times to just do it really simple. But God has called us to understand what it's like to give as his children. And I really want us to, to focus on that. And this morning, the sermon title that I have for this morning is that we need to give what is good. We've got to give what is good. You like getting what you ask for, right? We all do. Have you ever gotten what you've asked for before? It feels awesome, right? Well, sometimes it doesn't if it isn't given in the right way, artificially, or from a wish list, and all the person to do is click. So I think it's important that we think about how we give. And I, for that, I'm going to go to the book of Luke, chapter 11, verses 11 through 13, where Jesus talks about uh, giving gifts or giving and that relationship. And we'll, we'll expand on this uh, this morning. Jesus says this, Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, you will give a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? It's kind of an interesting verse. Jesus compares our gift giving. Those, if we know or don't know God, we naturally would give something good to our children. And Jesus is saying, and pointing it out, next to that, saying, if your heavenly Father is good, what will he give you? And it causes us to consider that. And I think that's important, that we need to know that God is giving us good things. And um, sometimes when we ask God for things, he doesn't always give us what we request, right? Except when we ask really silly things, like, God, give me patience. <laughs> Ever ask that silly prayer? <laughs> Help me to trust you? Oh, wow. I'm going through stuff where I got to trust you now, you know? And um, so we, sometimes we do get what we ask, but they're all for the purposes of what God has. And it's really important that we see that what God gives us, he does for the purposes of empowering us. Have you ever been empowered by someone? Someone who's believed in your potential? Someone who's come alongside you? Maybe it was a teacher or a tutor or a coach or uh, a parent or a pastor. Being empowered is a huge thing. Because you're able to recognize there's something within you that's worth growing and then sharing with the world. Being empowered is part of what we receive from God. We receive the Holy Spirit. And in that, we're empowered to be God's children. Without the Holy Spirit, we can't be God's kids. We just, we're at a distance because of Jesus, without Jesus. For example, we need to understand that what we need to give is good. And this week after Halloween, after all the candy was handed out, except at my house, we didn't hand any candy out because nobody came to our door. I guess we're scary or something. But uh, when my kids came home from school and uh, they had this bag and they said, Dad, I need you to fill this. Mom, fill this. With what? Canned food. Okay. Do you know why? No, my teacher said do it. Here you go. Fill it up. I got to take it Okay, well, you don't know why. No, I don't know why. Okay. So, Jess and I, we looked at our pantry, and, and we don't eat a lot of canned food, and uh, the only thing we could maybe scrap together was some weird-shaped pasta or some off-brand kind of, like, half-eaten box of cereal, and I don't think that's really what we want to give, right? I don't think that would be uh, really helpful, and, and so it's important that we understand that when we're asked to give, we don't just kind of give our leftovers. We shouldn't. And I know this firsthand because I know what it's like to receive leftovers. You see, there was this period in my life where um, I had a real hard time feeding myself. I was one in eight in our country who are hunger challenged. 
and I struggled with it for a period of time in my life, and, and uh, I finally came to that point where I swallowed my pride, and I, you know what, I'll, I'll go to a food pantry, and, and I, uh, I went to a Salvation Army, and, and I got there, and um, filled out the paperwork, and, and had some interview questions, and then sat down in this room with a bunch of other people from all walks of life, and then I got my number called, and I got the bag, and, and I went to where I was living, and and so I was going to see what was in there, and I took it all out, and uh, there was some very good basic stuff, but then there was a lot of it was kind of interesting. It was like off-brand stuff, or like there was, a, I remember this box of um, cereal that looked like it was ripped open and then taped up again, and, and, uh, and like, yeah, I, absolutely, I'm thankful for that. Absolutely. It, it, it met my basic needs, but what it, what I saw was it, it made me feel secondary. It made me feel marginalized. It made me feel like the people that gave, they couldn't give their best. They didn't, couldn't give what was good. They gave their leftovers. And it really changed my perspective a lot. That if I'm going to give to something, I need to be willing to give something that I want. Not just what's in the back of my pantry. And I think that's really important. In your life right now, what does it look like for you to give? How do you give? Where are you giving? Is it just really a swipe of the card, or is it, is it a click, or is it time, presence, words, resources, consistency? Are you speaking love? Are you, are you there? Are you, are you available? Because you understand and you get that that's what God's called you to. And I think that's really important. We understand that we want our kids to know, like my kids, I wanted them to know, yeah, we need to meet people's needs. But they need so much more. They need God. They need things in their lives that they can take in and digest and be empowered by the Holy Spirit so that they can transform and change and have hope and courage and be empowered to live a life that God has called them to. It doesn't just mean we fill a bag or we swipe a card. We need to give what is good. It's interesting. I, I lived in L.A. for uh, two years, and one of my classes was like a, like a, a field experience. And uh, we went into L.A., and we went into Skid Row of L.A. I don't know if you've ever been there. But L.A., Skid Row, it smelled and sounded and looked like when I went to Haiti. Just so poor. And in the middle of this very rich city. And we walked around and talked to people and went to local food missions and whatnot. And, and the thing about downtown L.A. is that Skid Row is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But the people there are still there. And every year, about $100 million goes into Skid Row. And the year after that, and the year after that, and there's still the same problems. There's still the same issues, same challenges. And just to walk in the middle of that, you just feel so helpless. Because it seems so big. Because there's so many systemic and other realities that play into the challenges that people have, have ended up there. And I think what's important and what it convicted me is that as a, as a person of God, how do I not live like I'm ignoring those issues? How do I live like I'm not adding to the problem? How do I live like in some small way? How am I giving what's good that helps bring those solutions to people's lives? That's the challenge that I walked away with, and that's what I challenge us to consider. Do we give that which is good, or do we hold all the good to ourselves? Jesus is telling us in these verses in Luke that as a father to their child, there's an understanding that what is given is good. There's a natural relationship and an understanding that you would give your child something good. You would expect from your parent something good. In that, in that anticipation, we expect God to give us things that are good. We expect God not to just give what's requested, but what can help us. And what we need at the very baseline as God's children is his presence in our lives. We need the presence of God. We need the Holy Spirit to build us up, 
to teach us, to refine us, to, to help break down walls, to help heal wounds, to help push us in a direction where, because God has called us to give and to do it from the power of his presence. And that's the exciting thing. If we're able to live into this, then we'll see that we receive the gifts from God, the fruit of the Spirit. Joy, patience, peace, kindness, gentleness, mercy, compassion, self-control, the gifts of God, teaching, preaching, wisdom, mercy, hospitality, compassion, prophecy, tongues, interpreting tongues, all these things that we get to be about and get to demonstrate in this world because of the presence of God. I wonder, do you know what God has gifted you in? What God's empowered you in? Do you have an idea of what you can use and contribute to God's plan and purpose in this world? And if you don't, I encourage you to find out. I encourage you to want to know how God has gifted you, how God has built you up, and how he wants to build into the potential that you get to live as a child of God, anticipating what he's going to give you. That's an exciting place to be. That's what we get to be a part of in this world. The world doesn't have any of that. They're scraping and fighting and biting and gnawing and manipulating and lying and, and stealing and cheating, trying to find something that's a value. But we got it. We got the Holy Spirit. That enables us to give what is good, not what's artificial. It's really important. And as John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13 says, I'll just read it to you. But all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. Need to recognize that you have been born of God if you are able to say, Lord, Lord. And if you are able to say, Lord, Lord, then you are empowered to give what is good because you've been given the best. When God looks in his cupboard in heaven, he doesn't look for the leftovers. No, God, he gave us his best. He gave us his son. He gave us Jesus so that we receive Christ and that we are to extend Christ. That is the good that we are to be about. That is what we are to extend to others. I remember this one time I, when I was at school, again, down in grad school, and I visited a, a church in Beverly Hills. It was literally half a mile from Rodeo Drive. I can't say rodeo. That's wrong. Rodeo. And this beautiful service, this high liturgical church, robes and choir and, you know, and everything, and, and this old church. And we went out on the church patio, and there was the usual coffee and donuts and conversation. And, and, um, and I was sitting there, and, and uh, I just observed on the sidewalk, um, this homeless individual came, saw that it was coffee and donuts time, and went over and helped himself. And, um, but I think he grabbed too much than what was comfortable for one of the church ladies. And so she said some words, he said some words back, back and forth, it started to build, right? And finally when I caught notice of it, I looked down and I see this group of church people in this home and just yelling at each other, just yelling. He's saying things that are ugly and they're saying things though there was no profanity, it was just as ugly. And then the minister came, because either someone got her or whatever, and she kind of came, and she had her robe on. And, and I remember, like, okay, this is a clear picture of the gospel, right? Right here. What is going to be said? And because I was shy, and I didn't feel, I didn't know what to do at that moment. And, um, and I was wanting to be a learner. And she came forward, and with her posse <laughs> behind her, she kind of said, you know what, you just need to leave or I'm calling the cops. And that just made him even more mad. And it just, it didn't turn out like I thought it would. It didn't turn out what it needed to be. Because in that moment, that minister needed to be a bridge builder. 
In that moment, that minister needed to understand that, that, yeah, that homeless man may be hungry, but he is thirsting for God. He may not even know it. And those people, those congregates on the patio, they may have full stomachs, but what they need is just as much understanding about what the love of God is as well. And we as ministers need to be able to bridge that. Not just ministers. Let me strike that. Us as the children of God need to be bridge builders in this world. That is the opportunity that we're given when we are willing to give what is good. And so I challenge you in the life that you're living right now, how are you a bridge builder between the love of Jesus and those who are disorientated and sitting in darkness. How are you being active in that? Because God is calling us to. And if we were able to take a snapshot of your life, would there be evidence that you are giving what is good? If it was a crime, a friend of mine says this, he's a very passionate man, if it was a crime to be a Christian, like it is in some places in the world, Would there be enough evidence in your life right now to convict you of that? I think that's key. I want to say, yeah, right here, most wanted. Put me on the list. Because I want my life to demonstrate that I get this, that I've received from the Father and need to give it to another. That's key. And all this comes down to what I, this verse that just rattles in my head all the time. Proverbs 3, 27. says this. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do so. Let me say it again. I think we have a slide. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. So, those who need the good, extend it to them. Do they have to look a certain way? Do they have to be a certain age, a certain race? a certain gender, a certain orientation, for them to be worthy, for us to extend the love of Jesus to them? It's not for us to stand in judgment. It's for us to understand that because of the word of God, we're going to stand not on bits and pieces of it, but all of it. Because a lot of people like to pick and choose truth. But I, I want to say something, that you need to stand for all the word of God, or you don't stand for any of it. That's key. And that doesn't mean that our role is to leverage judgment. No, that's, that's up to God. Us is to partner and empower by our love. Reveal and say, hey, this is what's worked for me. This is what I understand to be true about God. This is where he's come through. This is how I understand this situation. This is what his love has changed me and my life and my family. That's how we should approach the world. Because when we start drawing lines... Then we do exactly what those, those Pharisees did who had those stones. They wanted to stone someone. We shouldn't cast stones, but we should be offering love. And I think that's key. And the amazing thing about God is that he gifts you, he blesses you, sometimes he breaks you and refines you, right? All in the presence in preparation so that you can be offered over. What an amazing God that we He does that for us. And sometimes we go through things in life that God is actually preparing you to extend yourself in certain ways to others. Like if you've dealt with depression and you've mastered it or you're doing good right now, maybe you've learned those lessons so that you can give those lessons, that love and that ministry of presence to those who are stuck in a pit of depression. Or maybe you have have a marriage that's tested the test of time. And that you see marriages falling apart. Maybe God's calling you to offer those messages, those lessons, those seasons of life to empower another couple to hang in there. Or maybe you've experienced a divorce and maybe that could leverage you and motivate you because you've taken accountability or you've taken an understanding, a good look in the mirror of how you can help another couple to come back together or to hang on. Or if someone who's in a divorce, you can be there with them to help them know that they're not alone. Or if there's someone who's addicted to something and they're struggling... You can walk with them, relate to them, challenge them, encourage them, empower them, seek the potential because you've been there. What an amazing thing that the gospel does for us. It finds us, it cleans us up, it renews us, and then it sends us. 
That is what it looks like to live this wonderful life. And that's my hope, is that you aren't content with just giving in artificial ways, in backhanded ways, and yeah, add a dollar to my bill at the grocery store. No. We live in a community where we have people every day, like our officers, who put their life on the line. The officer told me that he thinks about this every time he starts a shift. He says goodbye to his wife and his child, and he looks at the door of his house, and he says to himself, is this the last day I'm going to look at this door? Because he is risking himself out there for us. And I think about, and it convicted me, like, am I putting myself out there in this community because I care just as deeply? Are you putting yourself out into the world because you're motivated by the love of God because you understand what he's already given you and it's causing you to risk? It's causing you to, to challenge and, and to take opportunity to give this same love to those that may be in your household, to those who live on your street, to those that are in the cubicle next to you, wherever it is, how can you extend what is good? And that's my hope, that we live this wonderful life and that we're not ashamed or afraid to give the good. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for this morning. God, I ask that you help us to see how much you've given us. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, may we offer you praise and may we extend goodness to where you've called us. Maybe we've never recognized it before, but maybe we are ready, invested, and prepared to give where we've struggled because you have redeemed us, you've restored us, and you've worked through us. God, may we not shy away from that. May we extend that good because you love us. And we can share that love with others. In this season of giving thanks, may we not just give thanks, but give what is good. May we exhibit and joyfully give our understanding and our love of you, God, to others. Use us. Push us. Draw us to your plan and your purpose so that we're a church community where life is happening. A wonderful life is happening. We love you, God, and, and in this we praise you and we give you joy and thanks. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Church, bless you, and may this be a week where we start to give what is good. And I invite you to go out and sing our, our closing song. God bless you.